Hey everybody, we are back this week with our new study in our Iron Man series called uh, Enter Wild. It, it's a book by a guy named Carlos Whitaker. Uh, he, he's, he's written a couple of other books before and I was, this book was recommended to me. And it's a book about um, having a wild faith. And we're, we're going we're gonna to be talking about you know, a lot of different topics that enter into that and how we develop this kind of faith and we get to see some wild things happen uh, with God and, and with our lives when, when we have this kind of faith. But we had this uh, discussion time already uh, this week with our men's group. We met Tuesday and Wednesday and we went through the first few chapters of this book. So I'm just going to kind of give you a recap uh, about that, about some of the things that we kind of talked about and the things that we felt like were important uh, in the messaging of this. So I want to start here with Psalm 31:19. It says, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you, that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. So let, let's stop there just for a minute and let's look at it. it says, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for those who fear you. So we're talking about uh, having an abundant life. You know, we hear that term a lot. We hear abundance, um, which means you have a lot of something. Um, you know, we've, hear, we've heard churches called Abundant Life Church. And so it's a kind of a common uh, Christianese type uh, language that we're hearing here. But to have an abundant life also leads us to uh, John 10.10. 10. Let, let me just read that. It says, The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Okay, so God wants us to have a full life. He wants us to be in our sweet spot. He wants us to be serving Him and getting the absolute most out of life. Now, does that mean every day you got to be just on and you got to be, you know, hitting it hard all the time and just completely in your zone? That's not how life works. We're not all living on mountaintop experiences. We all go through the valleys. We all go through the drudgery of work and, and the routines of going to work and coming back and being with your family and your kids and taking them to sports and all that stuff. And it's hard to feel like you're in your sweet spot sometimes when all of that's going on, it doesn't feel like an abundant life until we stop and we slow down. And that's what this is talking about. And the whole first section is about entering rest. And when you enter rest, you start realizing you have time to think and you have time to think about what an abundant life actually means and what an abundant life you actually have. And maybe perhaps you're even living life to the full, even though you didn't feel like you were. And 2007, I started a sports ministry uh, in South Africa after I'd finished seminary over there. And, and one of the first things I did was I, I went to the prison there in our town. It was kind of famous for, for where Nelson Mandela had come out of the gates and had the fist in the air and all the people were crowded behind him. And it was a, it was a big prison. It was a fairly dangerous prison. Uh, I'm not going to try to sit here and pretend that I was in danger while I was in there, but I was in there two or three times a week coaching basketball. We had four teams in there, and uh, I loved it. And I, I love the guys. I love spending time with the guys. The warden there was a, was a friend of mine, um, you know, who worked with the sports and recreation, and we, it was just a great situation. And I had an opportunity to, um, to welcome the Wheaton College basketball team to South Africa, and I toured around with them, and I got them games and clinics, and so one of our stops was at the prison. So on uh, that day, they brought uh, stadium cups to give to all of the prison basketball players. And on there was Wheaton College Thunder. And then on the backside, it had John 10:10 10, 10 verse. And, you know, and it said, I have come that they'll have life to the full. And one of the prisoners who had, had kind of gotten close to was a guy named Ricardo. Well, Ricardo had been battling with his faith and trying to learn what this whole thing meant. And this was a big day for him. This was a changing point, a you know, a turning point for him. So Ricardo looked at that verse on that cup, and he came up to me and he said, "Coach, um, how can I live life to the full when I'm stuck in here?" Um, he said, "What it, what does that look like?" So we started looking at that, and what does life to the full mean? And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. But for Ricardo, he did turn his life around. He did give his life to Jesus, and he became this uh, this light. In there and he led others to Jesus as well and I don't know what's become of Ricardo uh, but I do know at that time it was quite a change that I had seen in his life going from uh, a drug addict and a drug user and pusher and other things that he had done to really committing his life to Jesus and that's what it means to have an abundant life 
So I want to ask you this. Why has this verse, the second one, John 10, 10, why has it been so misunderstood? And I think it's this. I think that a lot of people, when they think that they hear life to the full, that means they're going to get everything they desire. That means they're going to get every wish is going to come true. All of their physical needs are going to be met. All their material needs are going to be met. There's never going to be any health issues or anything like that. And we have preachers on TV and on the internet and on podcasts and stuff that are preaching that if you are a follower of Christ, you're never going to lack anything. And they do emphasize the material part of that. And that's not necessarily the case. But the question is, is this promise of a full uh, of a full life or life to the full, is it really real? Okay, so let's ask the question here. If John 10.10 10 is for real, then why is life so hard? It's a real question. You know, if we're going to live life to the full, we think that life should be easy. You know, you want a promotion and somebody else gets it. You're having difficulties with your marriage. You're, um, you know, you think you're having faith like you've never had it before. You know, you're going to church. You're reading the Bible. You're having quiet time with God. You're studying you're hanging out with good Christian guys. You're listening to good Christian music. Um, you hear the, all this talk about peace, you know, and how that should come from Jesus. But your life just doesn't feel like it. You feel like you're battling. You're, you're swimming upstream. You're never getting ahead. And it feels like this promise isn't possible. And it feels like the only time this abundant life is going to come is when we get to heaven. And we, we think, and that's another reason that this passage is misunderstood. We think that those abundant things that we get are only going to come when they get to heaven. But that's not completely true. So the author tells a story about going to Disney World. And I don't know if any of you have gone. Most of you probably have. If you live around here, you've gone over to Disneyland. Um, some watching haven't. But you've been to other amusement parks before, most of you. And it's a full, series, a full day of uh, good and bad. And... As a kid, when you're getting ready to go to Six Flags or you're getting ready to go to Disneyland or you're going to go, you know, see the Star Wars exhibits and all that stuff, all you're thinking about is the fun part. As dads, we think about this a little bit differently. We think about uh, how hot it's going to be. We think about how long the lines are going to be that we're going to be standing in. Just thinking about Disney World right now, and if I had to think about what the day is going to be like, my knees are already getting sore and tight. My hamstrings are getting tired from just standing around all day in lines, you know, waiting an hour and a half to go on a certain ride. It's hard to do. And not everybody is uh, getting the fast passes or the gold tickets or whatever they are. They get you to the front of the line or lying about some handicap they have so they can get right to the front with 10 of their best friends. You know, this stuff drives me crazy. I'm sure it does you too when you see that happening. But for those of us that are just the regular person going in there, it is a day full of Drudgery followed by two minutes of absolute excitement. You know, life to the full, going on a Star Wars ride, doing Space Mountain, you know, doing all of these kind of fun things. But it's short lived. And, and that's what he describes as a life to the full looks like sometimes for us as men. But life to the full is often led much more by children because they don't look at all of the negative things. They're looking at just the positive things. They're looking at all the fun that they had that day. You're going home thinking, dang, I just spent $300 on food today between lunch and snacks and dinner. And it's a, it's a different mindset when children are, are looking at things than how we look at things. And Jesus told us to have faith like a child, didn't he? Okay, Because he knows. He knows there's an innocence there. He knows that children will stop and they'll think and they're thoughtful sometimes. Sometimes they screw up. You know, but they're not, and they're not perfect, obviously, but they do have this certain innocence and naivety about them that we as men have lost. And, and sometimes we don't live life to the full because we're going so fast and because we're seeing the negative instead of thinking, you know, God has really blessed me. You know, when are the, when's the last time you stopped and we're out in nature and we're thinking about all the good things that you have uh, in your life? Um, Another thing that comes up is when we're trying to live this abundant life, there's going to be some opposition. And, you know, the Bible tells us that uh, Satan is out there to kill and steal and destroy. He wants to steal our joy. He wants to rob us of, of relationships. He wants to ruin our reputations. He wants to tempt us into situations that we can't recover from in our lives and in our relationships. So there's going to be opposition 
to uh, this abundant life that we're all seeking. Okay, but what if I tell you that it's not God's plan just just to have the two minutes of fun like you have at Disneyland, that life is actually really about more than just material things or having a good time. Abundant life is this. It's living a life that's fully alive. To be fully alive, you have to live in the moment. If you're living in the past, if you're living in the future, you're not living a life that's fully alive. You have to be awake and alive and recognizing that the present moment that you have is what you're here for. And this is where the gift is that God's gives, given us. And we have to stop every now and then and, and look at living more in the present. So abundance is this. I want you to get this. It has nothing to do with accumulating things. Okay, let's just, let's just lose that, uh, that misconception right now. Okay, abundance is about having everything to do with connecting with God, connecting with Jesus, our relationship with Him, our relationship with others. That is abundance. Okay, that's happiness. We've been, you know, I've lived overseas. I've lived in Africa. I've been on to nine or ten other countries playing basketball. And I've seen people that have absolutely nothing that are the happiest people in the world. Okay, where does that joy come from? Where, how can they be like that? I've also seen very poor people that are uh, very unhappy. Um, you know, I've seen very wealthy people that were very unhappy. So it has nothing to do with where you are uh, financially. <laughs> we were, uh, I, I tell this story sometimes, but I went to Ukraine with a team of guys and we, we played some basketball games and we played some tennis and stuff. And we were, we were moving around and it, it was a missions trip and we, we were moving around town on this public transportation and we were mar- wearing these sort of a, a loud red track suits. Okay, so we're, imagine being at a, a city in Ukraine. It wasn't Kiev, it was another, another place. And we're riding this old trolley train thing through town. It was literally like riding the bumper cars at the state fair where the, the metal thing drags across the chicken wire and creates sparks. And the town was uh, depressing. And if you've ever watched that show, um, uh, Santa Claus is coming to town, the little claymation thing with the Burgermeister, Meister Burger, and, and all of that. Uh, and he takes away all of their toys and all the parks are empty and all that stuff. That's exactly what this town looked like. And the people that were on the train were depressed. They were just hunched over. They weren't talking to each other. They were cold. They had coats on. And um, they, just everything was gray and brown and black. And uh, everything they were wearing was just depressing. And we just stuck out like a sore thumb, not because of just the red tracksuits we had on, but because we were smiling and we were laughing and we were, in, we were enjoying the situation. I know it's different. We were there as tourists and we got to leave and everything. But your, your situation is only as good as you make it. And to make your situation good and to be fully alive, it has to be one where Jesus is the center of your life. But to get to this point of abundant life where we're reflecting and we're looking at the good things that are happening, we're not complaining, we're not living in the future and worried about what's going to happen. You know, we're constantly, as men especially, we're striving to be better at what we do. We're wanting to move faster to get more things done. When actually, um, the best way for us to get closer to God is to slow down. Um, We were created and I'm sure most of you still like this, when you walk to move at three miles an hour, okay? We don't move at three miles an hour anymore. We get in our car and we go 80 miles an hour or 90 miles an hour down the freeway. We get in, we get in planes and you know, other modes of transportation. We're moving fast. We're flying to other countries. Um, we're, we're taking in obscene amounts of information. Things are just moving fast. Technology is telling us you have to keep up. Uh, I don't know about you, but at my age, I don't feel like I want to keep up anymore. I've kind of hit my ceiling on technology, on how far I want to go, and I'm sort of uh, there right now. But all of us need to, and this is what this chapter was about, was entering rest, you know, and and rest has a bad uh, stigma today because when people talk about I need rest or I'm going to rest this weekend, I'm not going to do anything, we look at a person like that as being lazy. You know, we say, I'm going to go home and rest over my lunch hour. You're thinking, man, this person, all they want to do is go home and sleep. Well, maybe that's the best thing that someone can do is go back, take a little nap, get their mind turned off 
and get rejuvenated that way. But rest has almost become a bad word in our society. Uh, my son uh, was on his phone the other day, and he's on his phone a lot, as most teenage boys are. And, and I said, you know, when do you ever get a chance to just think? I said, you can't think when you're looking at your phone all day long, every day. And he said, well, well what do you want me to think about? I said, or what should I think about? I said, I don't know, just, just turn your phone off and think. Think about what do I want to do with my life? What do I want to do this year? What are my goals? What am I? He's like, well, I make goals. I said, I know, you're good at that. But, you know, to be a great thinker, you can't have your mind going all the time. You have to turn it off. You have to switch it off and see what God wants you to think about. We have to slow down. And the, and the author of this book talks about getting invited to go fly fishing uh, in Montana. And while he was there fly fishing, uh, he, he didn't want to go. He'd never fished before. He'd never held a fish. He came from Nashville. He was not an outdoorsy type person. And now he said after that trip, he tries to go fishing at least once a week. Um, and he recognized what I have recognized, and I hope a lot of you recognize too, is when you get away from everything and you get in nature and you get to a lake or you get to an ocean or you get to a river or you get to a, a nice golf course or whatever that space is for you where you can switch off. Okay, maybe it's kayaking, maybe it's canoeing, whatever. Maybe you go out hunting. Just somewhere where you're out in nature, you're communing with God, and you have a chance to switch off and enter rest. And he talks about how during that time, he was able to um, hear from God in a way that he'd never heard from him before. He said he had answered prayers just flowing in for the week that he was there. And I think we all want that. And I look at my life, and I know some of my biggest decisions I've made have been when I've had a chance to clear my head and be uh, around God's beautiful creation. So now the last concept I want to talk about is this, is being still. And being still before God is difficult because our society doesn't want us to be still. They want us to keep moving. And, you know, you may say, nobody cares if I'm moving or not. No, you're, you're going to stand out if you're not. If you're not moving fast and keeping up with the schedule like everybody else is, you're going to look different. But I want to read for you uh, from Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. When the Israelites saw the king of his army coming after them, they were frightened and cried to the Lord. They said to Moses, What have you done to us? Why did you bring us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There were plenty of graves for us in Egypt. We told you in Egypt, Let us alone. We will stay and serve the Egyptians. Now we will die in the desert. Okay, this, this situation is they are pinned up against the Red Sea. Pharaoh's army is bearing down on them. And they're all turning on Moses. Look what you've done to us. Okay, Moses goes to God. Uh, the next verse, and God uh, gives this message to Moses what to do. And Moses tells them this. I want you to listen to this. Verse 13, don't be afraid. Stand still and you will see the Lord save you today. You're going to have life after today because you stood still. Okay, you stood still and you let God go to work for you. Okay, difficult times are going to happen to you, maybe not as dramatic as what was happening to the Israelites, but there's going to be times when God's going to tell us, just stand still. Just stand still and let me take care of this. Okay, I've got this. I've got you. Okay, okay, nothing bad is going to happen to you, but you have to trust me, and I don't want you to try to figure it out on your own. Now, if we had looked at these Israelites, <clears throat> if I had to put myself in that situation, I probably would have been running around and getting all the other men and said, man, what, what kind of weapons do you have? Let's get what we got. And let's get ready to fight. Okay, let's go down swinging. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to uh, die just standing here and getting slaughtered. But God's telling them, no, I got this. And you see this all the time throughout the Old Testament, uh, actually, of God just saying, don't worry about this, Gideon. You know, don't worry about this, Joshua. I've got this. I'm going to let these guys kill each other. They're going to turn on each other. Uh, there's going to be a, a tremendous panic in the other camp. They're going, to, they're going to not be able to see. They're going to go blind. All these different things happen um, when we let God do the miraculous. And that's where this book title comes in, A Wild Faith. Okay, Entering Wild. These things that God pulled off were, in fact, wild for sure. When they stood still and when they relaxed, like we need to do, okay, God went to work. We look at verse 21 through 22. 
of that same chapter. It says, And then Moses held his hand over the sea. All that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind, making the sea become dry ground. The water was split, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry land with a wall of water on their right and on their left. We serve a God that does the absolute impossible. God hasn't changed today. He's still the same God. He can still do the same miracles. It's going to look different. You're not trapped against a sea with an army bearing down on you, though it may feel like it sometimes. Your situations may feel impossible. But we serve a God who does the impossible. We just have to enter into that wild faith. We've got to enter into that rest. And once we get to that point, and once we turn down the volume of the world, and we can hear God, and we enter that rest, God's going to do some wild things in your life too. You guys have a great week. Um, Hope to see you next week.